everyone. Hello and welcome. We're going to talk about compositions and inverses uh, for functions. So basic idea with compositions of functions is that we can have one function. We have an input, it gives us an output, and that output from the first function becomes an input to the second function, which then kicks out its own output. So ultimately we have an input into one function which enters in as an input into a second function and kicks out our output. So here's an example where we might care about doing this. Suppose we want to find the cost in dollars to paint an area A in square feet. Uh, in order to do this, we need to know the number of gallons of paint that are required. And ultimately, we can write cost not as a function of the number of gallons, but we can write a cost as a function of the area, which might be presumably what a contractor would actually be interested in. What's going to be the cost as a function of the area? Because how, you know, given the, uh, given the, number of square feet for a particular room or a particular job. This is going to give a sense of what their baseline cost is going to be. And so this is going to be the useful form of this function. All right, so let's take a look at how this might look. Suppose one gallon covers 250 square feet. So we would have N, uh, this number of gallons is equal to F of A. So A over 250, this is area of square feet. And then 250 square feet per gallon gives us number of gallons. Suppose the paint is priced at $30.50 per gallon, the function then is going to be 30.50 times the number of gallons, n. So c is going to be g of n, cost, g of n, $30.50 per gallon. But what we actually want is we want to know cost as a function of area because we want to know how the size of the particular project affects our costs. All right, so to find this, we need to substitute in n equals f of a into g of n. Right, so g of n is going to ultimately give us our cost Right? G of n gives us the cost as a function of the number of gallons, but this function, f of a, is going to allow us to get the number of gallons as a function of area. So ultimately, this, when we link these things together, this is going to allow us to put an area into here, and then it kicks out an n, which goes into this function here, and kicks out our cost. Right? See that little loop? That's exactly what we want to build. All right, so let's find this formula for cost as a function of area a. We know uh, C is, uh, cost is uh, $30.50 uh, 30 times the number of gallons. The number of gallons is going to be area divided by 250. We substitute the number of gallons into the formula C to get cost is going to be three, $350 uh, per gallon times, well, this is an expression for the number of gallons we need, area divided by 250. And then we just, uh, you know, uh, simplify these, uh, these uh, numbers and we end up with 0.122 times A. And this is going to give us C, cost, as a function of area. Uh, more properly, we'll say cost here is a function of a function. It's a composite function, right? It's a function of a function because we are getting area entering actually through this other function, which then kicks out our, uh, an output, which becomes our input into this function and then gives us our final cost. Okay. Right, so more generally, if the function giving c in terms of a is called h, so that c equals h of a, then we can write c equals h of a, which is defined as g of f of a. The function h is said to be a composition of the functions f and g. So in this particular example, our function h would be the function uh, c of a, right, c of a, our cost as a function of area is the composition of the two other functions. Okay. We'd say f would be the inside function and g would be the outside function. We always work from inside to outside. In this particular example, the composite function cost uh, as a function of area, so we have h of a is equal to the composition of g of f of a, and it gives us the cost of painting an area of a square feet. All right, very good. So now for two functions, f of t and g of t, the function f of g of t is going to be a composition of f with g. So f of g of t is defined using the output of the function g as the input to f, right? We work from inside to out. So we take the output of g of t to be our input to f. Uh, the composite function f of g of t is going to be only defined for the values in the domain of g whose g of t values are in the domain of f. What does this mean? This means what we're really interested in for figuring out where this function is defined is 
what values of g of t are going to be in the domain of f, right? Because we're going to it, it, we're going to put in values into g of t. It's going to kick out some values, and those values enter in and become the domain for this f of uh, f of g of t. And it's ultimately that function that's going to determine the domain of the composition. So crickets. It's a crickets example. The air temperature T in degrees Fahrenheit is given by given in terms of the chirp rate R in chirps per minute of a snowy tree cricket by the function T is equal to F of R, which is e defined as one fourth R plus forty. So if the chirp rate by chance varies with the number of hours since mid t midnight X, according to the function R equals G of X, which is defined as twenty plus X squared then we can find how temperature varies with time by obtaining a formula for h, where uh, t is defined as uh, h of x. Okay, so we want to find uh, how temperature varies with time using as this link that um, we have, we have uh, this link through the, through the rate, of, rate of chirps. Okay, so how does this work? Since f of r is a function of r, and r is defined as g of x, we see g is the inside function, f is the outside function. So we substitute r equals g of x into f. What was f? f is 1 fourth r plus 40. So we're going to substitute in right here. So we're going to have 1 fourth uh, g of x plus 40. g of x is defined as 20 plus x squared. So I'm now, gonna, now I'm going to replace 20 plus x squared and then uh, I'll be able to expand, and I have this plus 40. So what do I get? Well, 1 fourth times 20 distributing is 5, plus 40 is 45, and 1 fourth times x squared is 1 fourth x squared. The thing to pay attention here is we are bringing in g of x in place of r into this function here. And when we do that, it's really easy to remember we're going to have 1 fourth times this quantity, 20 plus x squared. Don't forget about this plus 40. Right, this plus 40 right out here. So that's important to remember. And then we evaluate, we just collect like terms, and we have our, com our composition. And then in terms of the domain for x is greater than, or, uh, greater than 0 and less than or equal to 10, we have t equals h of x um, or 1 fourth x plus x squared plus 45. Okay. Here's another example. Suppose we have f of x is defined as 2x plus 1. And g of x is x squared minus 3. Let's find f of g of 3 and g of f of 3. Uh, and then find formulas for f of g of x and g of f of x. And once we have those formulas, we can test those formulas um, and evaluate at the value h. Right. So these are going to give us our h function from before. Remember, we defined this function h as the composition. So let's go back here. Right, if we write uh, the function, uh, write the function, the composition, uh, in terms of uh, as h, the composition of g of f of a here was was h of a. Uh, so that's what we're trying to find here. In the second part, we're trying to find our our h function, our composition, more generally. Okay, so you can stop the video. Go ahead and give that a try. All right, presumably you've stopped it. Now you've begun again. Here we go. We want to find f of g of 3. Well, we begin by evaluating g of 3 because we want to work from inside to outside. So we take g of 3. So 3 squared is 9 minus 3 is 6. Okay, so now we're going to take that output. g of 3 gives us an output. g of 3 equals 6. That becomes our input for the f function. So I'm going to take 2 times 6. 12 plus 1 is 13. All right. See how that works? f of g of 3 merely means we're going to evaluate the function g at 3. And whatever is that output, we're going to then plug in and evaluate uh, and use to evaluate f. Right, so g of 3, 3 squared is 9, minus 3 is 6. That gives us an output, which we, gen we then plug in and we evaluate f of 6. So 2 times 6 plus 1 is 13. We could do the exact same thing for, for the other one. So now we want to find g of f of x. So we'll take f of 3. 2 times 3 is uh, 6, plus 1 is 7. 
That gives us our output, which is, becomes our input for our g function. So we're going to take g of 7, or 49, 49 minus 3. Sorry about that. That is annoying. OK. Uh, I, wish these, uh, I wish these prompts on the computer were far less intrusive, but alas. Uh, okay, so right, so we are finding g of f of 3, so we're going to plug in uh, f of 3. We're evaluating f of 3. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7. Then we're going to take that output as our input to this g function. g of 7 is 7 squared. 49 minus 3 is 46. And that's where we got this from. Notice, <laughs> the two numbers we got on this one and the one before are not the same. We got what? We got 46 here, and before we got 13, right? f of g of 3 was 13, g of f of 3 was 46. They're different. <laughs> um, and in general, that's true. In general, f of g is not going to be the same as g of f, though you'll find exceptions. All right. So in the formula, f of g of x, we have f of g of x. Uh, we have our input for f is our, g, our output from g of x, right? Because g of x is equal to x squared minus 3, so we put x squared minus 3. So we take f of x squared minus 3. To build our function, what is this going to be? Well, our f function was just 2 object plus 1. All right, so what's that object? x squared minus 3. And then evaluating, we get f of... Uh, f of g of x is going to be 2x squared minus 5. And we can evaluate. Let's evaluate at 3. So uh, 3 squared is 9 times 2. 18 minus 5 is 13. Cool. It works. All right, so now we want to find g of f of x. Well, g is going to take as its input the output from f of x. Well, f of x is 2x plus 1. So we're going to take g of 2x plus 1. Our g function, remember, was object, or input, squared minus 3. Okay, so that is 2x plus 1 as our input, because that was, uh, that was our output from f of x. And so basically what we're doing is we're reading in whatever value is going to enter f of x, 2x plus 1, it's going to kick out a value which is now being read into g. And here I've just expanded, so FOIL. So foiling gives me foiling, and then you know collecting like terms with this with this uh, with this uh, ones place gives us four x squared plus four x minus two, and I will evaluate g of f of three. This is like our h function from before. So four times uh, four times three squared is four times nine, thirty six plus four times three is uh, is twelve. So thirty six and twelve gives us our forty eight minus two is forty six. Cool, so that works too. Very good. So what have we done? We found our we found a general found a general function to represent the composition g of f of x, and we evaluated at three, and we demonstrated that that was exactly the same as simply just evaluating g of f of three, which we did just a second ago. Okay. Whoops, here I need to go forward. Okay, now we're going to talk about inverses. Turns out the role of a function's input and output could sometimes be reversed. So, for example, p, the population of birds on an island, is given in the thousands by p. Population is equal to f of t, where t is the number of years since 2007. t is the number of years since 2007. So t of 1 is going to, be, is going to indicate year 2008, right? So t2, that's going to indicate 2009. t4, 2011, right? Because t is the number of years since 2007. Um, right. In this function, t is the input, p is the output. If the population is increasing, knowing the population enables us to calculate the year. Right. So if we know the population is increasing at a constant rate, and you know we could back out what the year would have been for a given population. Okay. So thus, we can define a new function. T is equal to g of p, which tells us the value of t years since 2008, given the value of p, given the population, instead of the other way around. So in this function, p is our input, and t is our output. So the functions f and g are inverses of each other, right? f was giving us, f was giving us, um, uh, was was taking t as an input, kicking out a p as an output. 
G is taking P as an output and kicking out T as an input, or taking P as an input and kicking out T as an output. Okay, so since they're inverses of each other, um, they are invertible. A function that has an inverse is said to be invertible. Not all functions are invertible, but a lot of them are. The fact that f and g are inverses simply means they go in opposite directions. F takes The function f takes t as input, outputs p, while g takes p as an input and outputs t, which is what I said earlier, without screwing up. All right, so far we have said nothing about the names of the two functions, as far as their special relationship, but we can give names to them. And the names we give them are f inverse and g inverse. And basically what these are doing is just taking as a convention the pers particular perspective we're taking. So if we want to refer to one function, uh, to, to the function g as f inverse, that means we are taking the perspective of f being our primary function and, uh, and uh, f inverse being g. Alternatively, we could go the other way. We could have g as our primary function and we could denote f as g inverse, assuming that they're inverse functions. Okay, anyway, so for here, to express the fact that the population of birds, p, is a function of t, we write p is equal to f of t. To express the fact that time is also determined by p, uh, so that t is a function of p, we write t is equal to f inverse of p. So the symbol f inverse is used to represent the function that gives the output t for a given p. And this is not an, this is not an exponent. We'll talk about that. If the min if the to the minus one is affixed to the function, then it is indicating we have an inverse. If it is outside of the function, if it is outside the input, then we would have something else. Okay, but let's go back though. This is saying p is equal to f of t, t is equal to f inverse of p, right? t equals f inverse of p, well, that's just what we define as the g function. So that's what I was saying before, where we could either take f as our primary function and its inverse is g, or we could take g as the primary function and then denote f as g inverse. <laughs> inverse g. All right. So unfortunately, this notation could lead to some misunderstandings. We might interpret this as f of x to the uh, minus first power, which clearly puts f of x in the denominator of a fraction with a positive one power. In general, these two expressions, this expression and this, this expression, are in general not the same. Uh, this is f inverse of x. This is the output that gives us when x is put into the inverse of f. This right here is the reciprocal of the number we get when x is put into f. Right? See? f of x and then to the minus 1 power puts into the denominator that's a reciprocal of f of x. See? Not the same. How do we tell them apart? Well, does the minus 1 go onto the function or does the minus 1 go outside the function? If it's outside the function, it's doing this. If it's inside the func or right on the function, between the function and the input, then it's indicating an inverse function. Okay, so using p equals f of t, where p represents the population in thousands of birds on an island, and t is the number of years since 2007, what's f of 4 and what is f inverse of 4? Okay. So thinking carefully, uh, f of 4 is the bird population in thousands in the year 2011. Why? Well, t is the number of years since 2007. f inverse, the inverse function, is a function that takes the population as an input, refer, returns time as an output. So here we're going to interpret this 4 as 4,000. This is f inverse of 4,000. It's the number of years after 2007 at which there were 4,000 birds on the island. Suppose g is an invertible function with g of 10 is equal to minus 26 and g inverse of 0 is equal to 7. What other values do we know? Well, we can just think about the meanings of these things. Given that g of 10 is equal to minus 26, this tells us, oh, g inverse of 26 must be 10, right? This is taking an input and giving the output. Why don't we take this instead as the input? It gives us that output. 
So g inverse of 0 is 7. Let's take 7 not as the output of g inverse, but as the input of g. It must give us, it must give us uh, 0 as the output. Um, why? Well, we've made the assumption that these are invertible functions, that the inverse exists. Basically, what's happening is one function is undo the function and its inverse are undoing each other. Okay, turns out not all functions are invertible, but for those that are, we were able to find a formula for the inverse function. So let's do that. So back to crickets. The cricket function gives the temperature t in terms of chirp rate r. t is equal to f of r is equal to one fourth times r plus forty. Let's find a formula for the inverse function. R is equal to f inverse of t. Well, what do you do? Just solve for the other variable, right? So the inverse function gives the chirp rate in terms of the temperature, so we just solve the following equation for r. Right, so here was, here was f of r, t is equal to f of r, t is a function of r. Let's just solve this instead for r, this will give us r as a function of t. Cool, we got it. So r is equal to f inverse of t, or 4 times uh, the quantity t minus 40. Then we could talk about the domain and range of an inverse function. The input values of the inverse function, f inverse, are the output values of the function f. So the domain of f inverse must be the range of f, right? And vice versa for an invertible function. For the cricket function, t is equal to f of r one, equals 1 quarter r plus 40. Hey, if a realistic domain is going to be uh, r greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 140. Uh, plugging this in, we find the range of f has to be between uh, greater than or equal to 40 and less than or equal to 80. Right? Where's that coming from? Let's put in 0 for r. We evaluate this, then, then what t is equal to 40. And let's put in 160 for r. 160 divided by 4 is 40, plus 40 is 80. All right, see, that's where that came from. So then the domain of f inverse must be this range, and its range must be this domain. All right. Okay. So that is uh, diabolically simple. So uh, spend some time thinking about that, thinking about why that is the case. Don't just pass over that as thinking that, uh, that it's uh, too easy to study. Right. So. Spend some time thinking about this, and if you if you found that difficult, then definitely spend time reasoning through why that must be the case. Okay, so the relation between com compositions and inverses is, is is interesting. A function and its inverse undo each other, like I said. So calculate the co the composite functions f inverse of f of r and f of f inverse t for the cricket example and interpret the results. Well. They undo each other. So f inverse of f of r, this f inverse undoes this f. It leaves us with r. This f of this f inverse undoes each other and leaves us with t. Does that happen algebraically? Sure. f of r is equal to 1 fourth r plus 40, and f, uh, f inverse of t is 4 times the quantity t minus 40. Let's see. f inverse of uh, f of r, so f inverse, f inverse is 4. 4t minus 40, so I need to plug in this t. Um, I, plug in, I plug in my uh, f of r for that t. Okay, I've done that here. Um, and then I've got this minus 40. Yeah, so I've got this f inverse of 1. Here I'm just putting in the f of r. I'm replacing, I'm replacing f of r with its algebraic explanation, algebraic expression. And then I have to deal with this f of f inverse of 1. That's this function. I've already got this part. I've already re replaced this part. Now I just need this 4 and then this minus 40. Right? This minus 40 is coming from here. And then when you evaluate this, yeah, it's just r. What about this one? f of f inverse of t. All right, well, f inverse of t is uh, 4 times the quantity t minus 4. So I need to have f of for quantity t minus 40. Got that. Now I've got to deal with this f. What's f? f is 1 fourth r plus 40, so I'm going to take this as my input instead of, no, I'm going to take this as my input instead of r, so I'm going to have 1 fourth times this stuff uh, plus 40. Where'd the plus 40 come from? It's right here. 
And sure enough, when you go through this, this cancels each other out, and we're left with T. Okay. So if you find that confusing with how I've got this written here for the sake of the slide, just stop the video and write that out linearly on your paper, and you'll see it a little bit easier. Okay, so to interpret these results, we use the fact that f of r gives us the temperature corresponding to the chirp rate r, and f inverse of t gives us the chirp rate corresponding to the temperature t. So f inverse of f of r gives the chirp rate at temperature f of r, which is r. f of f inverse t gives us the temperature at the chirp rate f inverse of t, which is t. The functions f and f inverse are inverses be precisely because they, in, they undo each other when they are composed. So here's one more example. Let y equals f of x is equal to find as 2x plus, uh, plus 8. Find a formula for the inverse function and show that the inverse of the, the composition of the inverse and the function is just x. And the composition of the function and the inverse function is just y. Well, what do we do here? Stop the video. Go ahead. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we can write y is equal to f of x equals 2x plus 8, and we can just solve this thing for x. And if we solve this for x, we get x as a function of y. That is precisely what our f inverse gives us. Right. And then what are we doing here? Now I'm going to take f inverse of f of x, f inverse of f of x. Our f inverse was just our f, f, f inverse was just one half y minus uh, four. A better way to think about this is f inverse is just one half input minus four. My input is now two x plus eight because uh, that is my f of x. So I have one half input minus four, and then evaluating, I just get x. Suppose I take f of f inverse of y. Way to think about this is f of input, and now my input is f inverse, which we saw that we defined as 1 half y minus 4. So f of 1 half y minus 4 is going to be 2. Uh, let's see, what, what was this? 2 times that input plus 8. Sure enough, I need a plus 8, and I've got this here. And evaluate, and we find just y. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Let me know if you have questions.